So um, I am thrilled to be here though, because our speaker is a, a good friend who I've known for a while and an active member of the Lackawanna Historical Society run uh, since 2015, which seems to be an important year. Um, I think before 2015, I met you when we were doing the model railroading programs yes. over at Steamtown National yeah. Historic Site. We would do these fun programs and, and Ron had a collection of, of model trains and he would come out to do displays for us. But I joined the Historical Society in 2015, and it was in that year that Ron was responsible for installing a sign at the Electric City Trolley Museum. And I, I'm sure George has been there. Um, if you've been to the Electric Trolley Museum and you know the building that it's in, that building was once home to Macar trucks. The trucks were manufactured there, Ron? Yes. Yes, so Ron was uh, kind of the force behind installing a sign to let people know about the history of the building and the Mack car truck connection. Um, it was, I think, in the teens and the 20s that they were located there. And I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about that shortly. Um, and then it was the following year that Ron published the book that he's kind of going to be highlighting today, Scranton's Automotive Heritage. Um, and in that same year, you published a second book called Mack car Scranton? Mackar Trucks built in Scranton. Mackar Trucks built in Scranton, which is this massive tomb, tome that, that tells you all about trucks made in Scranton and it's fascinating uh, that it relates to this topic. So, so Ron is our guy. If, we, if somebody has a question about local automobiles or certainly Mackar Trucks, we go to Ron because he has been studying this for a while. And as I said, he also does the model train thing. And recently, I think you started to do some model uh, trucks as well. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yes. One of the original vehicles that was built in Scranton has pictures, but we don't have a model of it. So I got a 3D printer and I'm making a model of it, one tenth scale. So, so Ron not only uh, researches history, sometimes he rediscovers history or recreates it to bring it back to us. And so he's a great guy to know and to have as a member of the Historical Society. So I'm always grateful that Ron is there to share his information and his knowledge with us and, and uncover new history. So uh, today, Ron is going to share a little bit about Scranton's automotive history, and I'm going to turn it over to Ron Muskalchik. Ron, welcome. All right, thank you, Marianne. Uh, I've lived in the Scranton or the Valley for most of my life, and I'm sure as uh, most of you people who went to school around here, we learned about the coal and the iron industry and uh, uh, the textiles, the railroad trains, and the trolleys. And uh, one thing I never heard about when I was in school was the fact that Automobiles were built in Scranton. And so uh, I did a lot of research and started uh, gathering facts. Uh, we went to uh, Detroit Library, Philadelphia Free Library. Uh, of course, the historical, Lackawanna Historical Center was a great help. Uh, the AACA Library uh, to get some information about vehicles built in Scranton and the history of them. So today we're going to start off uh, with the Scranton's Automotive Heritage. Uh, Scranton has been a distribution center in Northeastern Pennsylvania for many years. The 100 block of Lackawanna Avenue was uh, noted as the wholesale block. And produce, train, and produce came in from, from trains, trolleys, and wagons to be distributed to local grocers and supply homes. The industries needed transportation for their products and the workers needed automobiles to travel to and from work. A gentleman, Patrick J. Collins, born in 1873, relocated to Scranton in the late 1880s. They lived in the Maluka section. Young Patrick first learned about electricity and electrical motors by working as a sock boy in a local electrical warehouse. By the age of 23, Patrick Collins had become so proficient in electric motor design, he was promoted to the manager of the largest electrical supply and motor repair company in the city, Scranton Electrical Works. The company had four or five branches of stores in the valley and would build special motors to order. 
In August 2nd, 1900, the first practical test of the electromotor carriage was made and proved entirely satisfactory. As the Scranton Tribune reported, Mr. Collins has been at work on his carriage for nearly a year. His workshop was at Bloom's Carriage Factory, which was located at 118-122 Dick's Court. The delivery wagon with two motors and spur gearing weighed only, only 2,000 pounds, complete with batteries. It was adapted to run 12 miles per hour. It would travel 60 miles over ordinary roads and city streets with a single charge of the batteries. The vehicle carried 44 80 amp hour cells, having a maximum discharge capacity of 32 amperes. Patrick, still manager of Scranton Electric Works, has been rebuilding and reworking this vehicle. After years of endeavor, Pat Collins formed a new company to get his invention to the market. A company with a capitalization of $100,000 was organized when operated under the name of Twin Motor Vehicle Company. The Twin Motor Vehicle Company was located at the corner of Lackawanna and Jefferson Avenue. On April 16, 1903, the night before the public showing, a malicious person entered the room with a crowbar, smashed the delicate mechanism and threw acid over the motor. Patrick and his crew had to work all night to revive the vehicle. He had a, a tough going starting out with his vehicle. A couple of years later in August 1903, a mysterious explosion of unknown origin wrecked the front of his company store. Nothing was ever written about the twin motor vehicle company after the explosion in 1903. It's common belief that it dissolved before any other vehicles were produced. As for a vehicle that seemed to survive the explosion, no record exists for it. Since automotive patents exist after that, it is believed that the vehicles moved to a private garage and worked on by Mr. Collins. In 1906, Patrick Collins designs and tests electric motors that powers trains and becomes a consultant for GE leaving Scranton. He has a patent on the first electric diesel driven uh, locomotive, which is pretty good for our area. Uh, Patrick Collins uh, worked for GE and left Scranton in 1911. If you wanted to see new model automobiles in the 1900s, affluent families had to travel to Madison Square Garden in New York City. Finally, on March 10, 1909, Scranton held its first automobile show with four vehicles, the Knox, the Thomas Flyer, the Brush, and the Buick at the Real Estate Building at 138 Washington Avenue. Now we're gonna to go to uh, the Mackhart truck. And to talk about the Mackhart truck, you have to talk about the Mack truck. Uh, unfortunately, the Mack truck did not make the Mack car. So it really gets confusing, but let's see if I can clear it up for you. The Mack family uh, moved to a farm in 1855 to Mount Cobb which is just a, 10 miles up the road from Scranton. In fact, the original Mack family's white barn still remains a half mile east of the Cortez Road Junction with 348. There were five sons, William, Charles, John, Joseph, and Augustus. This is a picture of the original family home in Mount Cobb. Uh, it was torn down many years ago and there's a, a housing development there now. This is John Michael Mack, known to all as Jack. He was born in 1864. His brother Gus obtained a job with a wagon and carriage manufacturer, Christian Falston in Brooklyn. Jack, who had experience with steam engines, found the opportunity to work at Falston with his brother. It was only evident that they would take over the Falston factory in 1893, when Christian Falston retired. Willie, their other brother, joined them in 1894. By 1902, they built an open seeing vehicle for visitors to New York City. The vehicle was self-powered gasoline powered bus that would carry 18 to 20 passengers. More were produced to meet the demand and the Mack brothers calling their vehicle the Manhattan. At the same time, Joseph Mack opened a successful silk mill in Allentown. In March of 1912, 
Jack Mack merged the Mack Brothers with the Sawyer Motor Car Company and the Hewitt Motor Company under the International Motor Truck Company. Jack Mack retires from the International Motor Truck Company and purchases the Webb Motor Fire Apparatus Company in 1912. The Webb Motor Fire Apparatus Company had A.C. Webb as president and Roland Carr as vice president. Roland Carr was born in 1874 in a small farm in Saluba, Iowa, and was manager of the Butler Brothers Eastern Division Mill Order. Jack started the Mackhart Company with Roland Carr as a financial backer. Mackhart took over the old Allentown Foundry and Machine Company building on 3rd and Walnut Street. <clears throat> the first Mackhart one ton truck was ready for show at Madison Square Garden in New York City on January 2nd, 1913. In 1913, Mackhart markets three models and sells 104 trucks. Now, in the early days, a truck manufacturer would not build the bodies. They would build the chassis, the wheels, all the uh, transmission, the engine, the radiator, uh, the dash, the steering wheel, uh, the wheels, the tires, but would not build a body, just give you a wooden seat and send you to a wood maker who would make the body that you would need for your business. In August of 1913, the Mackhart truck was named Car of Progress by the car manufacturers. Jack Mack was still disappointed with Allentown's council's decision and his years of investment in the city announced in December 3rd, 1913, that the Mackhart truck company would be relocating to Scranton, his hometown. The Scranton Board of Trade announced that the Mackhart truck company uh, would take over uh, a new, an old building on Cliff Street which was uh, owned by the Electric, which is now the Electric City Trolley Museum. Yeah, okay, familiar. Uh, they start, Jack Mack was the president of the company, W.H. Gardner was vice president, and L.W. Connell was the secretary treasurer. If you go to the uh, uh, Electric City Trolley Museum, like Marianne said, you will see a plaque on the wall behind the trolley uh, in the main lobby area. Uh, Jack Mack would live in downtown and would travel to Scranton to run the business. Roland Carr remained in downtown to start an accounting business and then moved to California. By January 14, by January 1914, the company was running with a force of 150 workers and an order of 50 trucks. The first Mackhart truck built in Scranton rolled out of the Cliff Street building on January 4th 1914. Mac, Jack Mack leaves Mackhart at the end of March to join an auto and truck sales company in Strasburg. In 1915, the Scranton had its first large automobile show. Uh, they had Hubbardville, Franklin, Chevy, Ford and Dodge, Jackson and Kissel, Haynes, Mackhart trucks, Cadillac, Buick, Argo, Lewis Six, Overland Empire, Locomotive in Oakland, Hudson, Jeffrey and Rio, Chandler, Studebaker, Packard, Chalmers, and Saxon. In 1915, Macor markets eight models and sells 220 trucks. Scranton was booming in 1915 so much that the Board of Trade had 215 companies on their doorstep waiting to come to Scranton. In 1916, Robert C.H. Rupp joined the Mackhart Truck Company as vice president, coming from his past position as manager at S.S. Kresge's in Scranton. Robert served mostly as vice president and once as president of Mackhart, but his enthusiasm and dedication provided the glue in the management that kept the company moving forward. Another gentleman, Frank Mueller, who was a machinist born in 1971, joined Mack Car in Allentown in 1912. Working closely with Jack Mack, Frank Mueller advances the design of working trucks as chief engineer. Frank Mueller would prove to be the most innovative truck design engineer of the age, 
and the individual that continues the vision of Jack Mack, making Mack cars the leading vehicle in all classes. One of Jack Mueller's, Frank Mueller's uh, notable inventions was called the Devonimo power plant. In the picture below, you can see a sub-assembly that would fit into the Mack car trucks. The sub-assembly included the radiator, uh, the engine, the transmission, the dash, the steering wheel, and all the uh, wiring in the engine compartment and the hood. If, if you had a vehicle, a Mack car, and you broke down alongside the road, you would be able to call your company. A tow truck will come out bringing a sub-assembly. They would detach six bolts and unhook a lot of connections and be able to replace uh, the new engine and get you back on the road within a half hour. This is a huge design and a huge plus for the Mack car industry. In 1916, Mack car marketed eight models, three quarter to three and a half ton and sold 318 trucks. On May 14th, Macar Company announces a new auto factory to be built off Providence Road on South Street. The, the factory had the capacity to produce 1,000 to 1,500 trucks a year and employ 500 to 600 skilled mechanics. Currently, uh, if you're familiar with the area across from the uh, Memorial Stadium from Scranton High School, uh, it's just a block in. It's now the home of all good things. And it's still standing and it's packed with uh, a lot of little wonders. In 1917, Macar marketed five models, one to five and a half tons, and sold 516 trucks. In 1918, Macar changed his logo, which appeared at the top center of the radiator shield. In 1919, the Macar company received a government stamp of approval and recognized in the country as the best motor vehicle truck construction. Macar at this Red. time was shipping I see, I see, I see. A, a lot of trucks overseas and to uh, the South America. Andrew Warman, who was born in 1863, was raised in the Scranton area. Andrew worked his way through the family business, the Lackawanna Laundry. By 1913, A.B. Warman was president of the Lackawanna Laundry and was instrumental in starting the YMCA at Scranton. These are pictures of 1919 Mack car. They made five models, one and a half to five tons. They sold 406 trucks. Uh, if you look at the upper left picture, you will see the Everhart Museum in the background. And the lower left picture, you'll see the uh, sub-assembly that the tow truck would bring out to fix uh, vehicles that needed help. In 1920, Macar added a main office and a new powerhouse building. The main office is still standing today right next to the uh, All Good Things. The 1920 automobile show outgrew the town hall and moved to the 13th Regimental Army Armory. Hmm. The show opened on March 1st to display 175 automobiles of 50 different makes for a week, followed by 160 trucks and farm tractors on March 9th for another week. Macar adds the main office in a powerhouse. Here's a picture of 1920 Macars. If you look at the upper picture, you'll see it's in front of the children's library and the Albright Library is just off to the right in the background. This is the inside of the uh, Macar plant. Uh, you can see it's uh, wide open. You can see all the frames that they're working on. And this is now where all good things are. In 1921, few people in the city of Scranton realized that there was in Clark Summit a very flourishing business known as Lackawanna Body Corporation. 
builders and designers of commercial box bodies for all types. The company started producing bodies in April 1920. It was located at the 100 block of Old Lackawanna Trail. The Mackard Truck Company used this body company for many of its trucks up to 1924 when the Lackawanna Body Company closed. On March 2nd, the Scranton Republic announced that Ted V. Rogers had purchased the Wilkesbury Mackard Sales Corporation from W.A. Chris. In 1919, Ted joined the Mackar Sales Corporation as treasurer of the Wilkesbury Sales Office. By 1922, Rogers was owner and manufacturer, owner and manager of the Wilkesbury and Scranton offices. Rogers joined with the Eschenbach Company as a prime shipper of A and P produce, running with a fleet of 50 Mackar trucks. Noticing that the trucking industry badly needed regulations for their safety. Ted Rogers became the first secretary of the Pennsylvania Truck Association in 1933 and director of the American Highway Freight Association. In 1922, Macar marketed 10 models, one ton to five ton, and sold 477 trucks. In 1923, Macar marketed 11 models, one and a quarter to five tons, and sold 389. The Macar truck family people are smiling broadly now over the unusual honor of theirs and the fact they received an order to de deliver five one half ton Macar trucks to the New York Daily News. Looking at the picture at the top, this is called the Macar Express. It was their newest model in 1923. It was designed for fast and economical movement of lighter loads ranging from one to one and one quarter tons. The Express reused a patented demountable power plant, the same exclusive feature on all Macar trucks. Comfort for the driver and safety was assured by the use of pneumatic tires. In 1924, Macar marketed 50 models, one quarter ton to five ton, so 395 trucks. And Lower Line uh, ran a bus service and bought three Macar buses from them. In 1925, Macar marketed 11 models, one and a quarter ton to five ton, and sold 287. The picture at the top, you can see the uh, was the Macar Truck Company building. You can see in both pictures, the Macar truck building in the background. In 1926, Macar marketed 11 models, one and a quarter ton to four and a half tons that sold 360 trucks. If you notice the upper picture, it's the LA Lewis owned vehicle uh, Dave Lewis of L.A. Lewis uh, owned uh, two Macar trucks. Uh, this one was sold in uh, about 10, 15 years ago. It is now in New Hampshire. In 1927, Macar marketed seven models, one and a quarter ton to five ton and sold 360 trucks. This is a, a Macar three ton, four or six cylinder. Six cylinder engines just started coming to effect in, in 1928. In 1928, Macar Mountis marketed seven models, one and a quarter ton to 12 ton, so 381 trucks. This is a picture of an LA Lewis uh, moving and storage van. This was the last. Macar truck to have resided in Scranton. L.A. Ulis owned this truck for many years. They restored it from the ground up. Uh, it is a very heavy vehicle. Uh, it is now in Maine or someone purchased it about four years ago. The cab is so big that a person could sit to the left of the driver and two people to the right of the driver. 
so they can have all the whole crew for moving in the front compartment. This is a picture in 1929 Macar market of nine models, one and a quarter ton to 12 ton, so 480 trucks. This is a picture of a Macar truck in front of Steve Shannon's Tire Center, 770 Wyoming Avenue, which was the original sales office from 1917 to 1930 for Macar trucks in Scranton. The Great Depression affected the country in August of 1929. The Macar truck sales, sales slowed, but the plant kept produce production going. Macar changed the building concept. Instead of just building the basic frame and running chassis of the truck, and then hiring an outside company to fabricate the custom body, Macar was now completing the full truck assembly, chassis frame and body in-house. This in-house production led to better quality scheduling and cost control. In 1913, Macar trucks were built to meet the needs of the owner. No mass production in the building of Macars announced the corporation. It was, it was working. Macar is now producing custom trucks. Everyone was custom made for the customer and the production was increasing. Large fleet buyers would enjoy the quality of the Macar trucks. We're now ordering specialized vehicles for the products. In 1930, they sold 12 models, one and a quarter ton to 12 ton. They sold 439 trucks. In 1931, a announced the opening of their new modern light day bakery, which was located on Vine Street near Penn Avenue. With the announcement came the order for 18 new Macar trucks for the a and fleet. This uh, added to the already 36 Macar trucks already running for the a and company. In 1931, Macar marketed seven models one and a quarter to four tons, so 288 trucks. In 1932, Macar marketed 11 models, one and a quarter ton to 12 ton, and sold 191 trucks. Again, in the upper right picture, you can see <laughs> our factory in the background. In 1933, Macar marketed nine models, one and a quarter ton to six ton and sold 64 trucks. The vehicle in the lower right, the St. John's Berry Trucking Company is uh, restored, one of the few that are restored. And it was just sold last year to a gentleman in uh, Maryland. The final days of the Macar industry. Many of Scranton's important leaders were board members of MACAR, Elm Connell of the Gas and Water Company and Worthington Scranton. On March 16, 1933, the last MACAR truck at 36A came off the assembly line. In March 20th, 1933, MACAR goes into receivership. J.F.W. Heinbogel keeps the company running and builds trucks from remaining parts shipped in from district sales offices. In 19, October 26, 1933, the last truck was built, the Model 100, and the plant closed. November 14, 1933, the Winslow Baker Wireling Company purchased the manufacturing material and leases the plant. The corporation plans to build Macar and Han trucks in Allentown, but it never happened. On December 15, 1933, the Macar facilities is listed for share sale. Over this, the history of the Mac car from 1913 to 1933, they produced 68 models and they built 7,239 trucks. Two companies were, with all the production and uh, the need for delivery vehicles in Scranton, two other companies were thinking about moving into Scranton, the economic car and the motor car. What were small delivery vehicles? that could run in the alleys and the side streets and get the produce from the grocer to the consumer as very quickly. Unfortunately, uh, both of them never made it to Scranton. Uh, one of them went out of business in 1914 and the other one had trouble transferring uh, its money across state lines and it never came to Scranton. So they were looking for 
joining the uh, the trucking company in Stratton, but it never happens. Of all the vehicles that roll out of the factories built by Scranton workers, it would be a miss to not re-mention one type of vehicle that was so vastly different from the aforementioned that they started their own industry. Designed to look at almost every detail like true automobiles that were seen on the streets in the early 1900s, the Hudson Miniatures were a three quarter inch scale model, scale wooden and metal model made to be enjoyed by all ages. The Hudson Miniatures Old Timers Antique Auto Kits have become an important contribution to automotive Americana. Anthony Tony Kobaleski was born in Kingston in 1910. Like many young boys, he was fascinated with the automobile. He became a pilot, a flight instructor a war of wartime aviators at the Shellsville Airport and an international race car driver. Tony was a collector of antique cars and antique toys. He started the Scranton Hobby Center in 1938 and in 1948, he was able to purchase a 1914 Stutz Spare Cat for a New York City car collector, completing his childhood dream. In 1947, Tony developed the Hudson Miniature Old Timers using his wife's family name, Hudson. These easily assembled, prefabricated scale models made of wood and lead, later changed to plastic, were developed after long hours of research and representative of one of the most authentic hobby lines ever put on the market. Workers molded the parts, cut out the wooden patterns, and assembled the kits in the basement of the store. The Hudson Miniatures Old Timers consisted of 20 different models. The first kit was a 1911 Maxwell, followed by 1904 Stevens Durier, 1904 Oldsmobile, 1903 Ford Model A, 1900 Packard, 1911 Buick Bug, 1903 Rambler, 1903 Cadillac, 1910 Ford Model T Roadster, 1902 Franklin, uh, 1906 Columbia Electric, 1914 Ford Model T Fire Engine, 1909 Stanley Steamer, 1910 International Harvester, 1904, 1909 Ford Model T Touring, 1911 Brush Delivery Truck, 1914 Studs Bearcat, 1913 Mercer Raceabout, 1906 Old 16 Locomotive, and a 1914 Regal. Each kit consists of a large instructional page with the history of the vehicle, sheets of balsa wood with pre -stamped, stamped parts, metal wire, molded plastic parts like the steering wheel and the four wheels, and a supply of smaller parts of balsa wood. The instructions suggest the colors to paint the parts and an option to turfing material for the seats. In 1951 and 1952, four new models of a 3A scale were introduced as Hudson Miniatures Little Oldsheimers, 1904 Oldsmobile, 1911 Maxwell, 1913 Mercer Runabout, and a 1914 Regal. Hudson Miniatures production ceased in 1953 with Aurora Plastics, purchasing the rights to the Hudson Miniatures Old Timers name and design. Aurora Plastics went on to produce plastic models of the Old Timers. Little Old Timers were sold to Revell and shipped to England where kits were made from them. Now, as many as, as I know from when I was young, I built many car models out of plastic from uh, Revell and Aurora Plastics. And thanks to uh, Tony Kovaleski and the Hudson Miniatures, I was able to, to get those models and they advanced to the part where I had a lot of fun. So I thank Tony. A warehouse that stored a large supply of the original Hudson miniatures that was destroyed by fire in 1958. The Scranton Hobby Center and Adams Annual were destroyed by fire in 1968. The business was sold and Tony retired in 1968. The pictures of the model cars that I just showed you were from the Don Clark's miniature memories collection. Anthony Kovaleski will continue collecting toys, driving his 1914 Studs Bearcat, and bringing smiles to everyone he touched. He mastered the ukulele and will play for many hospitals and nursing homes. His jokes under his Uncle Louis stage name will make you laugh until you cry. If you didn't get to know Tony, you missed a Scranton treasure. He was a good neighbor and a great friend, and he died December 20th, 1999.
that sort of concludes my presentation. If you have any questions or further information, uh, I have an email. You, you think of something you want to ask me, it's Trucks one word, at gmail.com. And I'd like to thank uh, the great help of Mariana and staff of the Historical Society, the Albright Library, AAC Library, uh, encouragement and guidance from T.C. Conley, and my wife for all the hours of proofreading and travel. Uh, thank you very much for uh, logging into the Zoom. I really appreciate uh, getting this out and I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, uh, give me a shout. Okay. okay. That way we could see everybody. Does anybody have any questions for Ron? Mm -hmm. Tina, you're muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Ron, I'm, <clears throat> um, I'm the niece of Ted Rogers. Oh, great. And he's also, was also my godfather. And uh, I didn't know too much about Mack car trucks. I left Scranton in uh, 1970. Um, but my sister, Nancy K. Holmes, the library is named after her in Greenridge. Right before she died, I don't know what possessed her. I was in Scranton. She said, we have to write a little pamphlet about the stories that our father told us, our late father and our late uh, Uncle Dan, who were both brothers of Ted Rogers. And so we sat down at her computer in, on Woodlawn Street and she started writing these stories. And one of the stories that she wrote, a little anecdote, I have no clue if it's true. She claims that my, our father, Hugh Rogers, who was the youngest of the Rogers brothers and became the president, by the way, of Eschenbaugh Rogers Company. He was a president the whole life of my whole life. I don't know how he got that I, from, I, I assume Uncle Ted started it, I don't know. But anyway, she claimed that our dad, who moved from Coaldale, where he was in the mines as a teenager, to live with Ted Rogers. He lived with him and his family until he got married. He, she claimed that when he was in high school, that Uncle Ted had some sort of a company where um, a vehicle was made, but it didn't have a cab in it. It was just a box with some other stuff. And then on the weekends, our dad, in his late teens, would drive this contraption to Ohio in all weather, and if, if he stopped, he couldn't turn it off. And when it got to Ohio, that's where they put the cab on. And then he would return in a fully made, whatever it was, vehicle. And that he did this, and she said he would make more money in a weekend than most men would make in a week. <laughs> now, I have no clue if this is true. It but could is be. it true? Huh? It could very well be because Mackard trucks did not have bodies in the beginning. Yeah, well, that's what he did. And I'm thinking we're talking about, um, he was born in 1903, my dad. So he probably was, was 1921 or something yeah. like that. And I would assume he was 18. I don't know. And I, nor do I know, please understand, Nancy Kay was literally terminally ill when she wrote these. She told me these incredible stories. I was long gone from Scranton. She heard them from my dad and other people, I guess. But all this stuff I learned today and about, Eschenbaugh and Rogers, I didn't know any of that stuff. I didn't know anything about Mac Carr. I'm fascinated to tell you the truth. So I salute you for doing this. Oh, thank you. It was really interesting. It was funny. I was at a flea market for trucks one day and I ran into the, uh, the safety council for a highway, the group that Ted started uh, after uh, he left Mac Carr. And I, I said to him, I say, you know, uh, he used to work for Macar Trucks. And he said, I never heard of that. I said, yeah, he has a great history with Macar Trucks before he started your organization to help all the truckers. So I gave them all the stuff I had about him. And they said they were thrilled because they, they had no background before him starting helping truckers out. Well, he became the president of the American Trucking Association. Yeah. After he worked, he went to Washington to work for Roosevelt first. And then he founded the ATA. And when he retired as the president of the ATA, and we're talking about 1948, 49, he was honored at a dinner in Los Angeles. And uh, my parents were with him and every state in the union presented him with something, uh, an extraordinary set of sterling silver that I don't know what happened to. And when his funeral took place in 1960, he was awaked at his home on Electric Street. Every single trucking association um, sent flowers and you couldn't even get in you couldn't even get into the house there were so many flowers and the funeral uh, cortege went from St. Paul's 
to um, practically to where we got out and done work on the way to St. Catharines. And there was a cop on every block. I'd never seen a funeral like that in my life. <laughs> but anyway, he was my uh, godfather. Thank God, because on my birthday, he always gave me a few bucks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're very lucky. You seem to be a, a very impressive and uh, person I was sure I'd love to have met. I came from good stock. I'm a well, Rogers, you know. Definitely. <laughs> Tina, I have to ask the uh, the story compilation that you have. Is there a possibility the historical society might get a copy of that sometime? Well, we called it a few minor tales, M I N E R, because because <laughs> we are the daughters and granddaughters of miners. Our dad and our grandfather in Coldale were miners, and uh, I have a copy of it right here. To tell you the truth, oh. and uh, it's just a pamphlet. And my niece, my late uh, cat uh, Betsy. She put it together and distributed it at the funeral. And Nancy Kay literally was writing this up until she was in hospice. And I, I didn't know half the stories. I'd be typing them and laughing, you know? And she'd tell me, uh, I don't like the way you write, Tina. And I go, geez, I mean, that's what I do for a living. I, I just, and he has a picture of, of the, in the back of the Uncle Ted as the oldest and all his children. Yeah, I'll send you a copy. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, and, and they are very funny stories, but we didn't get to do the mother's side of the, the Fitzsimmons ah. yet. <laughs> anyway, she uh, I really have to give her she she really under, knew all these stories that she'd heard from my dad who lived with her in the later years of his life after my mother died. So, yeah, I'd be happy to give you this, but I Thank never you. knew about the, all this Mac car stuff. I'm, well, I'm we're really all fascinated. learning something I'm fascinated. today. Great. I'm fascinated. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Well, I uh, think it's a very nice program, interested in, I did get the, is the Tina? It was interesting what you brought to the program too. So um, it's fascinating, but I learned a lot. I didn't even know all this existed. Uh, <laughs> that was very nice, the program, very nice. Thank you. We have a couple of uh, people uh, in the chat room. So uh, Tori Watkins said, wonderful show, thanks. When I was a kid, Tori, there were still a lot of Mack car trucks on the road, including a few fire engines from the Scranton Fire Department fleet. And Bill Halstead said, thanks for the program. It's very informative and entertaining. So um, I'm glad everyone showed up on a holiday weekend. Um, Ron, thank you so much. I, I knew it was going to be good because I know you are a dedicated disciple of uh, the Mack car uh, industry in Scranton. So I'm glad you're spreading the word and we were able to help you with that today. Um, our next program, there is a date uh, shift because uh, we are moving the program to June 23rd and it's going to be a sneak peek of our Beyond the Hill house and garden tour. So the tour is on June 25th. It's a Sunday, after, well, Sunday morning into the afternoon, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. You'll get to tour five beautiful homes in the Abingtons and a few secret gardens and some other surprises. Um, but we'll be able to fill everybody in on the 23rd of what's going to be happening on the 25th for the tour. So try to join us for that Zoom program and stay tuned for future announcements. Thank you everyone and have a great holiday weekend. You too.